sourcing properties on market, off market, pre-market, what are the different ways we can find properties and hopefully let you walk away with some tips in terms of what strategies you can use to, to make this process a little bit easier for you as a DIY investor. So firstly, what are the ways we can find property? So the most common one where around 70%, just, just under 70% of properties are purchased on market. So on market, you're gonna find most of these properties on realestate.com or domain. I guess a little stat for you, uh, realestate.com has a larger market share around about nearly all the on-market properties go through realestate.com where domain pick up about 80 to 85% of listings. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there, but that's where you're going to find your on-market properties. Um, and I guess the challenges that you're going to face when you're dealing with on-market properties is that they're on the market, they're available to everybody. So you're competing with every single other home buyer and investor who's trying to get to those properties. So if you are going to go down this route where you're looking at on-market properties, speed is your friend or your enemy here. So you really can't be waiting days upon days upon days to get to these properties. There is the odd exception there where um, sometimes those properties weren't snapped up earlier on in the purchasing cycle. So potentially there's been some price reductions along the way, but those properties that are on market, you're going to be competing with everybody. So um, that is the biggest challenge that when you get to those on market. So not the number one preferred way to go about sourcing property. I guess here at an advisory level, we're purchasing anywhere between 50 to 60% of our properties on market. There are still some good deals that can be found there, um, but they are much harder to find and you're going to be having a lot more rejection rates when you get to the, the on-market side of the purchasing. Next one you've got is pre-market. So I get asked this question a lot in terms of what is pre-market. So to give you a bit of an example, I'm a real estate agent. I'm coming over to your property and I'm looking to, you know, to get your, get your listing. So you sign the agreement and we basically agree that in, in two or three weeks time, we're going to list this market on, for open. And now what we may be doing in those two to three weeks, you know, I might've walked away and told you, hey, you need to declutter your home. You need to go pressure wash the driveway, mow the lawns, do the gardens, whatever it may be to prep this property for sale. But the agent might be walking around taking some photos and say, hey, look, we're gonna get prepped for sale. But what I am going to do in those that two to three week lead up is I'm just gonna put the feelers out there for a few pre people in my, my CRM here. I've got some either home buyers who, you know, this is a perfect fit for, or I've, I've got some investors and this may line up with them. Now, why might somebody sell at a pre-market listing instead of going to, to open? So can be a few reasons. Some people may just not want to have weeks and weeks and several days in those weeks of people coming through their home, having to, to make their home look like a display home each time. They might not enjoy going through that experience. They also might not enjoy or be physically able to prep their property for sale. And, you know, there's costs involved in terms of getting handyman in, you know, gardeners in, et cetera. So just be something that if they're happy to avoid, they can save some costs by going down that route as well. And there can also be reasons like extenuating circumstances. Someone might be moving. They may have gone through financial hardship. They may have broken up. They, whatever it may be, there could be health issues. So there are always valid reasons in terms of why people may sell at pre-market and getting onto those pre-market listings, which we'll get into just a little bit, is another way um, to make sure you're able to look at those properties because it is, is a big way. We also do pick up property, but it can be hard to get into. The next one we talk about is off-market property. So these are much harder to find. So what is an off-market property? An off-market property is a property that is essentially not going to make its way onto the open market. This is, you know, you're not going to find it on realestate.com or domain even after that two to three weeks goes through. And how do these properties actually become up for sale in terms of the off-market? So you may have a real estate agent who's out there knocking on doors, you know, talking to mum and dad and just saying, hey, have you thought about considering selling your home? And, and they might turn around and go, well, I would sell the property, um, but I don't want to bother through an advertising campaign. I don't want people walking through my home. You know, I wouldn't even consider selling this property unless I got price X. And then the real estate agent goes, well, okay, well, well, let's just not list it. Um, I'll take some photos. I'll just reach out to some people, but it's never going to, 
to get listed. So that might be one way. Could also be through, again, people might be friends and family of the agents, again, avoiding uh, link your commission fees, franchise fees, advertising fees, etc. cetera. Um, could also be because financial hardship is also quite a lot of off-market properties that come from uh, elderly people either passing away or moving into nursing homes, et cetera, and, and family, you know, it's a bit of a, a tough emotional time. So going through open homes and kind of dragging that process on is not necessarily something that a lot of people want to go through either. So there are other options, it could be bank sale, it could be a myriad of things. Off-market properties are a lot harder to find. I think the biggest misconception in the market though is that some people think off-market properties that you're going to be buying these properties 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars under market value. Um, that is often not the case, particularly in this day and age where you've got desktop evaluations and, and valuators can get out there pretty quickly. But what we actually find at an advisory level is a lot of these off-market opportunities are grossly overvalued. Um, if you don't do the, the right due diligence, it can it can really come back to bite you because you almost for some time you don't actually have the sounding board in between where I might be looking to sell my home. I think my my property is worth say five hundred thousand dollars, and the real estate agent might be turning around and saying, "Hey, well, yes, might be able to get five hundred thousand dollars because the home up the road sold for five hundred thousand dollars." But just so you're aware, that property that sold for five hundred thousand dollars had a pool, had decking, you know, was was more up to date, was a little bit bigger in land size. So they don't necessarily have that sounding board always involved either. So sometimes the deals don't always stack up as well, but sometimes they're great. So getting ourselves exposed to these off-market opportunities is definitely uh, a way we want to try and strengthen our, I guess, purchasing power through that stage. So some of the tips I would recommend for DIY investors when it comes to sourcing property. So firstly, if you are wanting to avoid going down the on-market route, well, it's it's reaching out to people and trying to get into either their pre-market or off-market opportunities. So this is reaching out to real estate agents, giving them a bit of a spiel and letting them know what exactly you're looking for, letting them know that you've got pre-approval in place. That is absolutely paramount. They want to know that you're serious, that you're not just shopping around, letting them know exactly what you're looking for and exactly what types of locations you're looking for because otherwise real estate agents are going to just be shipping you off anything. So you need to be very clear, but letting, I guess, striking your intentions really, really early. And you're going to need to do this at volume and you're going to need to build some rapport with the agent over the phone. It's not as simple as, as ringing up John Smith and saying, hey, John, if you have any pre or off market opportunities, can you just shoot them my way? The agent wants, is going to be far more likely and receptive to do that if you've taken the time, you've built some rapport, giving them a bit of a spiel of your story. One thing you do not want to do when you're having that conversation with agents is disclose what your budget or price range really is. You may give some parameters in terms of what you're open for and and just give them something to work with, but you don't want to let them know that, hey, my budget is $500,000 because guess what? You're only going to be presented properties probably between four eighty dollars to $500,000 and they're going to be pushing you to, uh, towards that maximum each and every time. So just a few tips around that. There will be some scripts and, and things to follow in this to assist you with that. But that's just some of the, I guess, the one percent is that you can work your way through. But understand, this is going to be needed to be done, done in bulk. We're not talking about five agents. We're not talking about ten agents. And just just to give you some idea in terms of the scope of work that that goes to here in an advisory level, we have over two and a half thousand agents in our database that we are constantly keeping in contact with to be able to tap into these pre and off market opportunities. So this is a, something that has multiple people dedicated working to this on a daily basis. So again, these are some of the, the, the things that make it harder to compete with at a, a higher level and, and kind of leading into that, the challenges you are going to face as a DIY investor is understanding that these agents, they're, they're not as transactional as you may think. It is a relationship business. So they get calls, particularly if you're trying to buy in an area. So if we use Pockets of Perth, where we were purchasing quite heavily kind of the early 2023 and well before then as well, we kind of transitioned out of that market. But Perth, for example, 
you wouldn't be able to speak to a real estate agent in that that state at the moment that isn't being hounded by investors every single night. They're all out there doing several different courses with similar scripts. And the agents hear those scripts and they hang up, they check the voicemail, they, they get left with this information, they don't call you back and it happens time and time again. So that's going to be something that's really, really hard to overcome as a DIY investor. And again, it's going to be something we're going to try and have to naturally foster those relationships. The other thing that's really hard to, I guess, replicate as a DIY investor versus, you know, an, an advisory service is the volume in which you're purchasing. That real estate agent knows you're going to be purchasing more than likely only one property from them now and probably for your lifetime. So they're not going to be building any type of sustained excess here in an advisory level. You know, we might be purchasing as an example, there was an area in, in Queensland where we purchased over 120 homes over a 12 month period. So not only are we doing deals with the same real estate agents, the same agencies, we're then able to build and foster relationships with the directors. Now you might ask, why would a real estate agent want to strike up a deal with a buyer's agent or even an investor? You've got to get your head around and understand that for these agents, Agents are always trying to secure new listings and move volume. They're not necessarily interested in doing open home after open home after open home. You know, 20 or 30 people rock up to the open home on a Saturday. Well, guess what? There's 20 or 30 people that they need to call, text and email on the Sunday and Monday, finding out are they actually financially qualified? Are they looking to buy now or are they first home buyers shopping for the next six to 12 months? Are they the neighbor next door? All of these things that they have to go through, they don't really enjoy that. They enjoy turning over property and, and making a profit. So for them, if they're partnered up with somebody that's able to help them move quickly through a transaction, now obviously the deal still needs to stack up, but they're far more likely to do that. And typically speaking, your real estate agents will gravitate towards buyer's agents to work with them because they understand that not only are they representing maybe one or two clients, they may have a, a book of clients that they're working with, but their clients are finance ready. So they're ready to transact. They've got a professional working with them along the way. It's a much smoother transition for them. So that's one of the big transactions, I guess, that you, it's really hard to replicate. And then some of the other things that are hard to replicate from a DIY investor is just the sheer amount of volume of properties you can can get through it. It is, you know, I harp on this about the time. It is a very time consuming, tedious process we go through. Every acquisition for us as a business is in excess of 125 hours or more. And that continues to get more and more as, as listings across the country reduce. But if we look here, you know, on a national level, we typically look through every single suburb, which is 15,300 and growing every time. We then end up filtering that down through the data algorithmic and the manual verification down to about one to one and a half percent of suburbs at any one time. And then it goes through a filtering process where we then look at every single pre on and off market opportunity that comes through on a weekly basis, typically between about four and a half thousand to seven thousand properties per week. They then go through a preliminary checklist, thousand of those properties pass. They then go through a street spot, a street, uh, street sweet spot analysis, bit of a tongue twist to that one. And then they go through a final due diligence checklist. That'll normally leave us 80 to 100 properties to keep filtering through. And this is before we've even put an offer, before we've even done any of the site find, uh, checks in terms of building and pests, price negotiations, um, et cetera, and return on investment calculations. So it is an arduous time consuming task. If you do have the time and you're going to commit to finding a property by yourself, these are the steps you want to take. It's when you're following these steps, they're going to yield you the best results. And that's why we want to make sure that you feel like you're armed and confident to go out there and find properties not only on market, but also these off market opportunities and navigating this space. I appreciate you guys taking the time to get through this today. Just as an FYI, the next deal we're going to go through is contract negotiations. What are some of the, the points we want to be putting in our contract negotiations and how it can, I guess, successfully help us negotiate that price negotiation, but also those conditions along the way. So thanks again and see you in the next.